video is sponsored by Squarespace, the easy and reliable way to build a website for yourself or your business. Use my code Potential History for 10% off your first Squarespace order, but more on that a little bit later. History is written by the victors is an extremely dumb phrase, and all it tells me is you don't know how the historical process works. And you've probably heard this phrase many times, usually at the end of a historical debate with someone who doesn't know what they're talking about, as this final argument before giving up. And it insinuates a lot of things that just aren't true. That once an army, country, or politician is defeated, the grand conspiracy of those who hold the keys to historical knowledge have they and their followers silenced, unable to tell their story, completely demonizing them for all time. And that there are a select few big-brained Redditors who have come across the real story that everybody following the narrative doesn't know. And it's just completely not true. History is written by historians, and here's how they do it. Well, here's how the good ones do it. We'll get to the bad ones in a second. For anybody who already knows this, you can skip to this timestamp, but I'll be brief. Also, God help me for footage. I have no idea what I'm going to put on here. I should have just filmed myself talking, but I say too many ums like adult. First, an author decides a topic that he wants to write about. Note, just a topic, not necessarily a thesis or point of view yet. A good historian isn't out there to prove anything, he just wants to investigate a certain thing, and the thesis comes later once he's found evidence of what happened and later makes an argument. He then goes and looks at sources. There are two types of sources predominantly, primary and secondary. There's also tertiary sources, but th these are the main ones. Primary sources are sources that were made during the time of the incident or by someone who was there. Secondary sources were made after the fact using primary sources normally. So our historian here is going to be making a secondary or tertiary source. Now, is he going to just copy down what the primary sources say and take them as fact? Nope! He is going to pick out the sources that he sees as most reliable and use them for the basis of his work. How does he do this? Well, there are lots of ways. If we're talking about World War II, for example, some of the most reliable sources you can use are the interdepartmental memos or reports, armies sizing up the effectiveness of their vehicles, talking about what happened at a particular battle, statistics, maps of troop positioning, anything used by one side to assess its effectiveness in the war. Why are these so reliable? Because the people creating and reading these documents are going to want them to be as accurate as possible so that any problems that they find can be fixed and they can be fixed as best as possible. You're not going to tell your engineers that your tank is just the best darn thing ever created, they always hit their targets and they never get destroyed, because you want to be finding faults with the design and fixing them to make it more effective. Leave the invincibility stuff to the propagandists, and for things that will be published and seen by the public. Documents like this are fantastic, but they're highly technical and limited in their scope. So where do you go for the other stuff? Well, there's lots of things, including memoirs, interviews, letters sent home, film archives, pictures, pretty much everything else. However, this is where you get into stuff that can give you trouble. Because although people say, first-hand accounts are great, they were there, who else would know what happened? Humans can be incredibly unreliable and biased, either on purpose or not. What were you doing three weeks ago exactly at 2 p.m.? Now be sure to get it right, because this is going in a history book. People's memories don't always hold up so well, especially in something like a war that's extremely stressful and could be very much colored by your personal experience. It would be a very bad idea to write a book on how the US Army fought in World War II, and your only source being what one GI told you, because although he was there, he only experienced one very small microcosm of the whole war, and one wouldn't have the authority to speak on all the fronts the army fought on, and two, may be very biased based on his own experiences. What if his rifle happened to be one that was defective and jammed up all the time? You would probably then have a whole chapter on how the M1 was a terrible weapon and hindered the American war effort, when in reality, we all know that's not true. Similarly, if you asked a soldier who was around tanks that needed repair for most of their time in the war about how good the Sherman was, you would, oh wait, that's already a book. Anyways, our historian is going to have to be very careful about what people said who were there and not lean too much on a single person's account, even if it's a biography. Because guess what people do when you ask them to tell their stories in their own biography? I don't want to shock anyone too much here, but they lie. People always try to exculpate themselves. Very few people write memoirs and say, and the, book, the memoir is called My Fault by Robert M. Satino. People write books that say, you know, your fault. That's what, that's what memoirs, people sometimes say, this memoir is particularly self-serving. All memoirs are self-serving. That's why people write them. 
So after very carefully selecting sources and trying to find the most accurate picture of what actually happened, picking a thesis and writing a book, is our boy done? Ha! No. Far from it. And if any history book that you are currently reading was done at this stage, you may want to take it a little less seriously because if you're writing a very serious history book, it will then go through a process called peer review. And this is where a bunch of other historians in the same discipline will attempt to tear his book apart for an accuracy for any given thing. For example, using a source that is not quite that good, then relying heavily on it. Go rewrite every part, if not your whole book, that use that as a source or it will not pass peer review. And the people that are reviewing your book aren't just doing this as a favor to try to make it better. They are professional historians whose careers live and die by their ability to both write and size up reliable historical material. So they're not just doing this as a kindness, their review process and making sure they do it correctly for any books with their name attached to it will make or break their career. If our historian puts a book out full of a bunch of myths, not only will his career be trashed, the careers of everyone who reviewed it and said it was a reliable source of information will trash their careers as well. So suffice to say that the peer review process is not just a quick rubber stamping. It's a serious process by the discipline, and if you make it through, you have written a very good book. And anyone who wants to read accurate history should be reading books like these that went through this process. And in this process, I hope it's noted that there was not a step where the author had to check with the winners of whatever thing he wrote about to see that they were okay with what he wrote. History is written by people who use sources and list them in the back of their books. All right, here's the 411, folks. Say some reader is dissing your historical facts. You just give them one of these. And there are plenty of books telling the stories of the losing side. It may not be the story you want to be told, but have you ever thought that maybe the reason the story you want told isn't told in very good peer-reviewed books because it didn't happen the way you were convinced it did? Maybe? Maybe? My name is States Rights. You can actually find books that do tell these stories of the losing side, even the ones that are factually inaccurate. David Irving has written many books that range from flirting with to full-on glorification of the Nazis. It turned out he was completely making up his sources, trial transcripts down below, but he was completely allowed to publish the quote, other side of the story and all its inaccuracies, and nobody stopped him. There are a great number of German army memoirs that have created untold numbers of myths that were published and read by millions. The U.S. Army asked Franz Halder, German Chief of Staff, to helm the writing of the U.S. official history of the Eastern Front after World War II, and just let him and his buddies say whatever they wanted to. If that's not literally the definition of the loser writing history, I don't know what is. In fact, the mainstream view of World War II is chocked full of myths of Wehrmacht and Tiger Tank superiority, and Hitler being the only one that made bad decisions directly from these guys. And it's far from the winner-centric point of view. I know this because of all the people who still believe it and wrote angry comments in the Germany Can't Win video. So in conclusion, history is not written by the victors, it's written by historians, and history is a constantly evolving thing. As more sources come to light, our understanding of it changes. For example, there's been a ton of new books reshaping our understanding of the Eastern Front ever since the Soviet archives opened. So the best source on the Eastern Front in English in the 60s probably is full of inaccuracies now because of what we know. So whenever you hear a claim that you're not so sure about, read up on it. Find a book or a historical journal that can give you accurate information that you know is well sourced. And when that YouTube documentary that you stumbled upon at 3 a.m. says a bunch of stuff that really seems to go against what you've heard before, but is really making a good argument out of evidence that you also haven't heard before, and speaks really authoritatively, double check that it's not cherry picking things to give you a biased interpretation of events. And this leads to kind of an awkward moment because I myself don't normally cite sources in the description. And there are two reasons why. One, I see these videos more as a form of entertainment and would discourage anybody from using them as a form of historical research. Two, when I do make big claims and want to back them up, I tend to mention where I got the information in the video and point people towards a lecture by the author whose book I thought was really good. Because to me, it makes sense to stick with the medium. If I tell someone to go read a book, they probably won't. But if I send them to a video as they're watching a video, they might like it and go read the guy's book. And I always make sure that I send them to a video of them speaking on the topic that the book that I read is about to show my points. But in the future, I will start citing more often. 
As when you make such wacky out there claims that small country couldn't kill big country, you need to back it up with a ton of evidence and maybe not just put it in the video. Anyways, thanks for watching, and I hope this helps you in your future historic studies. And because it's inevitable, hi Reddit, did you like my video? Be sure to write 20 paragraphs about what you think, and hi, I'm an idiot. I bow down to your large brain. This is a Reddit moment. So, as you can imagine, a lot of the discussion on this topic and debate surrounding it has taken place on the internet. And if you feel strongly about it as I do, one of the best ways to get on top of the issue and get your ideas out there is with a website for all to see your thoughts and arguments. And one of the best tools to get started on this sort of endeavor is Squarespace, the sponsor of this video. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform to build and personalize an online presence from websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics with a great focus on easy customization of your website for whatever you need it for. From promotion of a small business to fighting dumb historical myths that refuse to die. Doing so with a very user-friendly interface, even if you haven't done anything like this before, with an almost overwhelming amount of options to change every detail of every page with a large catalog of starter templates catered to any type of website you're looking to build. You can create your own online business or side pages to sell products with detailed analytics on inventory and sales that can connect to your social media accounts for easy sharing of your content. I'm planning to launch my own site with them towards the end of January, and the experience doing so has been very easy, and I've been able to create exactly what I had in my head. If you want to make your own site for anything from what I listed previously to anything else under the sun, head to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash potential history and use code potential history to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thank you to my patrons on Patreon as always for the channel support. I've had many long discussions with them about our mutual hatred for this phrase and hope they like the video. Be sure to tell me what you think of all this down below and I'll see you on the next one.